uh, this Wednesday. We'll do Genesis 19. Yay. We've got to have this interesting Wednesday night routine going on here. Uh, movie nights will be first and third <laughs> Wednesday of the month. Um, and then praise and worship night on the second Wednesday. And then probably the last Wednesday of October we'll do Genesis 20. Um, and then until Friday, Ladies Bible Study, 945 a.m. at Patty's house. This will be lesson number six in the Chosen Workbook. Now, we have a Mexico trip coming up October 15th to the 17th. If you would like to go, which I encourage you, if you haven't been already, please go and talk to Patty. She would love uh, someone to travel with, someone to help, and it's, it's, it's a blessing to uh, be there and serve amongst them. Um, and then now we have a chili cook-off, October 24th. That will take place on a Sunday right after church service. So if you want to make chili, if you know how to make chili, please make chili. And I think we're are we doing a competition here. Are we in it for the goal? Okay. Yeah, we should. Yeah, the winner will get... Chili. Uh, <laughs> Maybe a prize. We'll, we'll discuss it. Um, and also, I didn't have room to fit it on there. But we have, again, I want to mention this the fundraising banquet, the silent auction. Um, this is for the Pregnancy Resource Center, October, I believe it's 2nd, 6 p.m. Tickets are $50. I think that goes towards your meal and perhaps maybe some raffle tickets. Or uh, I'm not really sure exactly what the $50, but it's for a benefit. It's going towards them. Um, and there's going to be foods like cheese lasagna, salmon, and uh, what's the other one? I think chicken and masala. So real high class. Um, so please buy a ticket if you want to go and support them. So let's pray and continue on with some worship. Father, we just thank you for another day to serve you. We thank you that we are here with your people that love you, God. And we just pray that you have a work in our lives this morning. And we just pray that this worship is... Uh, pleasing unto you, Lord. So, God, we want to worship you now in spirit and truth and just be excited that uh, you're God, Lord, and, and that you're for us and not against us, Lord. And we think with you all things are possible. So, God, we want to worship, Lord. And, you know, sometimes we walk around walls and they feel like they're never going to fall. But, Lord, with you, you're faithful. You never fail us. So, God, uh, we worship you now. Even if we came in here with perhaps a bad attitude with, with our head down, uh, God, we want to worship you this morning. And just be excited and worship you through the good and the bad. So, Lord, we love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. If you would please stand, if you have the capacity to stand, and let's worship. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You take me from Oh, my. 
Many churches are teaching from the Bible. They read the Bible, leave the Bible, and beat their own drum. But here today, we're going to go verse by verse as we always do, and allowing the Word of God just to speak to us. So last week, we left off with Paul on the beach of Miletus, and now he's determined to go. And that is the message of uh, the title message uh, this morning, Determined to Go. And we're going to see Paul is determined to go to Jerusalem. Um, and so that's where he's going to be heading in Acts chapter 21. And we saw that over a few accounts that people have already warned Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Chains and afflictions await you. But Paul already knew this, and Paul didn't care. If Paul wrote in the last chapter, none of these things move me. I am bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. And so he said to the Ephesian elders, you will no longer see my face. And it was a very emotional scene. They were on the beach. They are all praying, kneeling down, weeping, sorrowing. And then, then they walked Paul to the ship, and it was their final goodbyes on the side of heaven. They would never see Paul again because of what awaited Paul in the future as he was walking in the will of God. So Dr. Luke continues to write, picking up in verse 1 of Acts 21. It says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail during the straight course, we came to Kos. The following day to Rhodes, and from there Patara, and finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed in Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. When he had come to the end of those days, we departed, and we went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children. Till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we had heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with them not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he had, so when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. So again, Father, we do thank you. We just pray that you speak to us through Acts chapter 21. And may we just learn what it means to walk in your will, what that looks like, what we find in it, Lord. So God, would you be with us? In the precious name of Jesus, amen. So again, in verse 1, picking up there. Now it came to pass that when we, this is Paul, Luke, and the others, had departed from them, right, the Ephesian elders, um, and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos. Um, one thing I want you to uh, note here is in this verse, the word departed, it, it means to be torn away, to tear oneself away from something in agony. And that's something Paul had to do on the shore, on the beach of Miletus. He had to tear himself away from agony because he loved the Ephesian elders so dearly. And so it's very interesting. Sometimes in your life, you're going to find that when you're walking in the will of God, he's going to ask you to depart from things that you love. Because he wants you to chase after the calling he has placed upon your life. Is there anything this morning that is keeping you back and hindering you from walking in the will of God for your life? Sometimes those hindrances come in different sizes, shapes, and forms. Sometimes um, they can be things that we perceive as bad, right, as idols and addictions. God wants you to leave those things so you can enter into his will and walk according to his will. But sometimes God wants us to leave things that we perceive to be as good, such as people we love, places we love, jobs we love, even sometimes home fellowships that we love. God will call people out of churches, even though they love that church, to go be a missionary in, let's say, Mexico. Sometimes God will call people out from things they love, and they have to depart in agony because they love either that, those people, the place, the job. They love it all, but God will call them and say, there's something more. There's something more. So are you willing to leave what is bad or what is good 
to enter into God's best. You see, Abraham was called by God to leave his land and to leave his family and to go to a land that God would show him. Now, do you think that was easy for Abraham? No. I mean, that was all that Abraham knew. That was all that Abraham loved. But the book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham stepped out in faith not knowing where he was going. He had no idea. But as you read through the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis, you see that he, he enters into God's best. He is used by God in, in one of the most tremendous ways, becoming the father of many nations, becoming the father of our faith. That's quite the thing. But he had to depart and tear himself away from things he was familiar with, things he loved, that he may enter into the call and God has assigned to him. Again, we've all been assigned to course. In Paul's course, that God has assigned him to go to Jerusalem. You know, that other day I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw a nurse. who It was someone I knew back in the day from high school, but they evidently became a nurse. And they were posting a status how they lost their job because they refused to take the COVID vaccination. And, but, praise God, it sucks for a gun. And again, that's, a, that's a, a choice of liberty. If you want to take it, take it. If you don't want to take it, God bless you. It doesn't matter. Um, but at the end of the day, she, she, she refused to take it, so she lost her job. And at the end of her post, she said, please pray for me. She prayed that God would open up a door, saying, I know God has something so much more in store. And I think you know, within 24 hours, the next day she posted saying, God is so faithful, God is so good. He has given me another job. I'm now a nurse at such and such hospital. But listen, she had to depart. She had to be torn away from all she knew. That was her environment. That's what she went to school for, to become a nurse. And she lost that job. But she left something good. She was torn away from something good that she may enter into something better. God had a different calling for her to be a nurse at a different place. It's just miraculous. But here in the scene is Paul being torn away from people he loves to enter into God's best. Although chains and afflictions await Paul, being in God's will is the best place to be. And Paul will see that. So going forward, it says, they set sail, running straight course, we came to Kos. Um, hopefully this works. Hopefully I'm not blinding anyone. They don't take the ceiling. <laughs> Um, so now, but they're over, I think it's, um, <laughs> this is hard. Am I hitting anybody? No, no we're good? Okay, well now they're, so they're sailing the cost of about 40 miles, um, well actually 30 miles. So now they're going to go to Rhodes, which is about a, another 30 miles or so, or 20 miles. And then they're going to come to Patara, which is, uh, 30 miles. So this is what it's saying here. It says, they went straight for cost, the following the next day to Rhodes. And from there to Patara. And evidently Patara, they find a cargo ship because it's going to tell us in verse 2. They find a ship, but in verse 3, it tells us they had unloaded the cargo. This is some free information for you. Um, but finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, now that's a 400 mile journey, we went aboard and set sail. Uh, we can read these verses in a matter of seconds. Like we're just like, Paul went from here to there, that's it. But we have to understand that in months of Paul's life just went by. He wasn't on airplanes and trains and automobiles. This, this, this wasn't a 24-hour trip. This is months of Paul's life journeying, and, and we just get it in a matter of seconds. But we, and we don't have all the detail and the context of what took place on these trips, the conversations, none of that. But it tells us now in verse 3, When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left and sailed to Syria, and landed in Tyre. So they're leaving Patara, going past Cyprus on the left, and they land right here in Tyre. Um, and Tyre is now northern Syria, and uh, the, Jesus actually was in Tyre during his earthly ministry. Um, he, he left from all the commotion uh, to, to get away from it, and he encountered a woman who had a demon-possessed daughter. This is where Paul and his companions are right now. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. Verse 4, in finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. Now, this is the first mention we have of disciples in Tyre. Evidently, Paul accidentally planted a church in Tyre 20 years ago when he brought havoc against the church. They all scattered out from Jerusalem, going to Judea, Samaria. Evidently, some went all the way to Tyre. And so they're meeting some here. Uh, they told Paul through the Spirit, and here it is again, not to go up to Jerusalem. And we're seeing the Holy Spirit being very active in the early church. Um, but again... Paul doesn't care. He's not moved by these things. He's not moved from his purpose. He's still determined to go to Jerusalem. Verse 5, when we had come to the end of those days, that's the seven days of Tyre, we departed and went our way, and they all accompanied us with the wives 
And the children, I think that tells us something about Paul's character, and it's not just with the men, but also the wives and the children. So we were out of the city, and we went, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. So just at the end of seven days, Paul's with men, their wives, their children, they're kneeling down on the shore, they're praying. There's a great moving of the Spirit, warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but he's going anyways. Verse 6, when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus and greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. So they just went south from Tyre down to uh, Ptolemaeus, probably only about 10, 15 miles, I would assume. Um, but now we're seeing their disciples all over the place. All, this is northern Israel. There, there's people all over the place. Um, the disciples, the gospel is going out. And now it tells us in verse 8, on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now, I would have loved to have been at this scene here. Uh, this is Paul and Philip encountering each other for the first time uh, since 20 years ago. The last time Paul was with Philip was 20 years ago in Acts chapter, you could say, 7, 8. And Saul brought havoc against the church, and they all spread out. But remember, Philip was one of the seven. He was chosen with Stephen and five others to become deacons of the early church to oversee the practical needs of the church. And it was Stephen who was the first martyr of the early church. He was stoned at the consenting of Paul. It tells us in Acts chapter 8, picking up in verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And that's where we began to see miracles break out in Samaria. We saw a great revival. John and Peter went down to Samaria to confirm these things. They laid hands upon the Samaritans, and they were baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. But it was in the midst of this great revival in Samaria that God then called Philip out into the desert to meet with an Ethiopian eunuch. If you recall, quick story, he led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. And it went on to tell us in that chapter, picking up in verse 38, it said, So Philip commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, as in Raptus, he was raptured away, uh, the supernatural uh, transportation, uh, so that the eunuch saw Philip no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found in his Otis, and passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Samaria. So that's where Philip has been for the last 20 years. He's been in Caesarea. Evidently, he settled down and became a family man. We're going to see in the next verse, he has about four, four daughters. Um, but again, the last impression that Paul the Apostle, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, left upon Philip wasn't a good one. It was because of Saul of Tarsus that Philip had to leave his home in Jerusalem, and he fled to Samaria, which led him to Caesarea. But I want you to imagine the scene here. What was this like when Philip is just hanging out in his living room? He hears a knock on the door. He opens it up, and he looks into the eyes of a man who killed one of his best friends, Stephen, 20 years ago. What was that like? No doubt Philip has heard the rumors of what has happened to Saul of Tarsus over the last 20 years. He's heard it, but he hasn't seen it with his own eyes. He lost eyes with Philip. And now he's inviting not Saul of Tarsus, but Paul the Apostle for the first time into his home. And he's hearing this man who was once so monstrous speak God talk, speak about the things of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is certainly a Kodak moment. But I wonder if Philip at this point in time has already forgiven Saul for what he has done. I mean, because sometimes forgiveness isn't easy. It can be difficult. Some people hold on to grudges. They hold on to unforgiveness. But I believe God places forgiveness before us because we're so easily offended, injured, betrayed, and hurt by other people. But what do we do when someone who has been so monstrous to us gets saved. And I wonder what Philip is thinking. I mean, he's thinking, Saul, I used to hate you. I, I was praying to God that he would kill you. you. You hurt people I loved. You hurt people I knew. But here you are. 
I mean, this is such an extraordinary scene that's, that's taking place here. So it says this in verse 9, as Paul and Philip are together, it tells us now this man, Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now, many Bible scholars believe that these four daughters were all under the age of 16 uh, because they were virgin daughters. Um, were they quadruplets? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, if so, uh, Philip and his wife would have had a lot of um, a lot on their plate, <laughs> phrasing up these four quadruplets. But the point of this, this scripture right here is to tell us that his four daughters were Holy Spirit-filled young girls. And that's such a rarity nowadays. To see young people on fire for Jesus, to see young people filled with the Holy Spirit. But the historian Eusebius tells us that these four daughters moved and lived in Hierapolis until the day that they died. But they were acquainted with, uh, uh, his name is Papias, who was the first bishop of the Hierapolis church. And he would record about them, how they had just amazing insight and information in regards to the way the early church practiced. So no doubt, these four girls, they were set apart by God. Just imagine just seeing a family photo of Philip, his wife, my four daughters. I mean, it would have been amazing to see that. But going forward in verse 10, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, this is not the first time we were introduced to Agabus. We saw him in Acts chapter 11. Um, he went down to the Syrian Antioch church and met with Paul, and he prophesied. It tells us in Acts chapter 11, 27, and in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So Paul is no doubt familiar with Agabus. Um, and somehow Agabus is led by the Spirit and, and knows that Paul is in Philip's household. So it says in verse 11, When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this bell and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now this is very interesting, uh, because Agabus doesn't say to Paul, Don't go to Jerusalem. Rather, he just says, Whoever owns this piece of clothing is going to Jerusalem, and when they go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to them. And so everyone else is saying, Paul, the Spirit's telling me, you're not supposed to go to Jerusalem, but here's Agabus speaking through the Holy Spirit saying, when you go, this is what's going to happen. But not once is Agabus forbidding Paul to go. So it tells us in verse 13, or, uh, sorry, 12, thank you. That's why you guys are here. <laughs> Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. So we can just picture here Philip and his four daughters just begging, saying, please, Uncle Paul, please, don't go to Jerusalem. We want you to stay here. You know, and this is a very human response, right? It's very natural for people want to, wanting to keep Paul out of any trouble that lies ahead. But one thing I want you to take note of is when Jesus revealed to his disciples, that he would suffer and be crucified. What did Peter say? Peter said, not so, Lord. And how did Jesus reply? Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Exactly, get behind me, Satan. You are not mindful of the things of God or of the things of man. You see, Jesus has already purposed in his heart that he's going to suffer and he's going to go to the cross. He already knew what awaited him. And Peter had no right to stand between the Son of God, Jesus, and between the, the will of the Father. Just as these people here have no right to stand between Paul and the will of the Father. So it goes on to say, Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So now Paul is kind of arguing back here, saying, Listen guys, I am ready to be bound in Jerusalem. Not just that, but I'm ready to die in Jerusalem. I mean, this is my dream to preach between before all the Jews in Jerusalem. I mean, there's no better thing than this. This is what I want to do, and no one can stop me. But here's the great debate. Is Paul supposed to go to Jerusalem or not? That's something the church does argue over. Because the church is saying, Paul, you're going to go to Jerusalem, but we don't want you to. Because you're a living treasure to the church. We need you desperately, Paul. Are you not listening to the warnings and the prophecies that are being made to you, Paul? 
Why are you ignoring those things? So again, who, who's, who's wrong and who's right in this matter? Is Paul supposed to go or not? But although what they're saying is true, we have to keep in mind that Paul has already written something very, very interesting. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 13, verse 9. Paul wrote, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. That's pretty important to know. Because although the prophecy may be right from these people, saying, Paul, you're going to get hurt if you go there. We have to understand that a lot of the human aspect, a lot of the humanity, a lot of the emotion is getting mixed up into the spiritual thing that's being communicated. And a lot of that's happening here. The impression that's coming upon the heart of the church is, Paul, you are going to suffer if you go to Jerusalem. But they don't know how to communicate it, so they're just saying simply, Paul, don't go. Don't go. And that's why you and I need to be careful when people say to us, or when we say to people, thus says the Holy Spirit, or the Lord told me this, the Spirit told me this. We have to be careful when we say that because a lot of our humanity and our emotions get mixed up in the prophecy that's speaking through us. Because all of the prophecy is right, the Holy Spirit's speaking through an imperfect human being such as myself. So, again, in this scenario, I believe we're both right. Again, the impression upon the heart of the church is Paul, pain and afflictions await you. That's what the Holy Spirit is certainly signifying. But Paul is also correct saying, I can't turn back. The Lord has put this on my, part, on my heart. I'm not going to surrender. I am going to go. So we have a very interesting scene here with these people, with Paul saying, listen, you're making me weep. Please, please don't break my heart. And so as we look into the next verse, it tells us, then um, in verse 14, so when he had, when we would not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. So evidently, everyone here that's with Paul is trying to dissuade Paul from going to Jerusalem. That is a servant. They're, they're trying to stop Paul from going. They're doing everything they can, but they cannot dissuade Paul from going to Jerusalem. Why? Well, just a few months back, when he was in Corinth, he wrote a letter to the Romans, and he wrote a very important truth. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, it says, Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, that would be Jerusalem, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you have to understand that Paul, he was already persuaded of something. He wrote this truth to the Romans several months ago, and it is still burning in his heart, and he's not going to back down. Luke and all the others can see that. And so they say, fine, we did all we could do. We tried, but the Lord's will be done. But I truly believe it was Paul's destiny to go to Jerusalem. Because after he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to spend two years in Caesarea, where these amazing, extraordinary interviews are going to take place between him and Luke. And Luke's going to write things down. And then from there, Paul is finally going to make his way to Rome, where he's going to write, Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, Second Timothy, I mean, all these amazing prison epistles that no doubt changed the world. And these epistles were more effective in evangelism than Paul would have been if he was a free man traveling and evangelizing. The epistles were so much more effective because they speak to you and I today. For the last 2,000 years, people have been reading these epistles. It was, it was no doubt God's direction for Paul to go to Jerusalem so eventually he could make his way to Rome and write all these amazing words to us. So it says in verse 15, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Now that's about a 60 mile journey going down from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, so evidently they have friends in Caesarea. They brought with them a certain Manasin of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. Uh, so they encounter Manasin, who's evidently a early disciple, which means he's an old disciple. He's one who's been there since the beginning. Um, I don't know what that entailed. Perhaps he was there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when they were endued with power from on high. Or Manasin was with Jesus before the crucifixion. Or perhaps way before that, he was a follower of John the Baptist. We don't know. But they found great fellowship with Manasin. And they stayed with him where they lodged. And in verse 17, and when we had come to Jerusalem, 
Now keep in mind, Jerusalem, the estimated population at this time is about 500 to 600,000. Some suggest it's less. But on these mandatory feasts, such as Pentecost, there are over 2 million people in Jerusalem. So Paul and his people are walking into a crowd that is just, uh, that city that is just filled with 2 million people. And it tells us the brethren, as in the church, receive us uh, gladly. Um, and we don't know what form the, the Jerusalem church has taken at this point in time. We know from Acts chapter 15 that the Syrian Antioch church uh, was essentially became a mega church. And I can only just believe that Jerusalem is equivalent to that, if not more. Because on the day of Pentecost, the church of Jerusalem told us that 3,000 were added. Then we saw that 5,000 were added. And then we saw that the Lord multiplied and added to the church daily. So I know that the, the, the number must be incredible. And one historian recorded for us that by the, by the time the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, there were 100,000 Jews that came to the Christian faith. So I don't know where it is exactly on this timeline. It could be anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000 believers at this church in Jerusalem during the time of Pentecost right here. So it tells us in verse 18, On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Now this is, again, another extraordinary scene that you and I could only dream to have been at. Here is Paul leading the pack of a bunch of Gentile leaders, Titus, Luke, Timothy, Gaius, Aristarchus, Secundus, Trophimus, all these guys, Paul is going to introduce to James for the very first time. What was it like for this Gentile church leadership to be clashed with the, the, the church in Jerusalem, all these Jews? What was it like for them to meet James for the first time, the half-brother of Jesus Christ? You see, the epistle of James has already been in circulation for about a decade now. Perhaps some of these Gentiles have already been exposed to it and read it. But what was it like for them to sit down with James? What did they ask him? What was it like growing up with Jesus? What was it like when you found out that your older half-brother was God? What delighted him? What made him smile? What made him laugh? You know what, James? What did your older half-brother Jesus speak to you this morning? You know, James was a man that would never leave his brother's side. He acquainted the name Old Camel Knees because he prayed eight to ten hours a day to the point his legs were deformed. He never left his brother's side. They knew that James didn't know Jesus just as his brother, but also as God. James, what did he speak to you this morning? I wish we had a recording of these conversations that are taking place here at this meeting. It would have been phenomenal. But not only is James there, but also the other elders. Perhaps this is John and Peter. We, we don't know. John and Peter, at this point in time, could already be with the other apostles in different countries. Because uh, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you see that all the apostles, in fact, did go to different countries where they were eventually martyred. Um, besides John, of course. But we, we don't know if they're on the scene here. But again, a remarkable meaning. Verse 19. When Paul had greeted them, he told in detail, the Greek is literally translated, he told one by one, those things which God had done amongst the Gentiles through his ministry. So here's Paul relaying to the Jews, well, the, the Christians, the Church of Jerusalem, I meant to say, um, everything God has done amongst the work, uh, amongst the Gentiles. And, you know, Paul's probably talking about Salamis, Paphos, uh, Pisidian Antioch, uh, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, Corinth. Ephesus, Athens, all these places. He's just relaying all the miracles that took place. He's talking to them about all the work the Lord is doing. We have to understand that Paul at this point in time has already sailed over 8,000 miles. He has traveled over 7,000 miles on foot. He has evangelized the territory 1,500 square miles over the last 16 years. And I can just picture all, all of them and the Church of Jerusalem, their jaws just dropping as Paul is telling them one by one in detail all the things that took place. They're, they're, they're hearing for the first time the work that the Lord is doing throughout the entire Roman world. Hearing what God is doing outside the Jerusalem box. And so here's the response coming up in the next verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And that would be a great place for this chapter to end. Because as we go forward, things get a little bit more difficult. And we're going there. So, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews, right? How many thousands of Jews 
there are who have believed, right, believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and they are all zealous for the law. As we go forward in the next few verses, you're going to see that Paul is put into a position where he's going to have to be all things to all men. Uh, for the sake of the Jews, he's going to be requested to become a religious Jew, in other words. So let's see why. It tells us in verse 21, but they have been informed, right, these thousands of Jews have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children or walk according uh, to the customs. And, and so here we're seeing there's these false rumors circulating around thousands of Jews. They believe that Paul has said, I want you guys to stop all customs of Judaism indefinitely. But Paul would never say that because Paul knew that would ruffle some feathers. And again, Paul wants to be all things to all men. Paul even wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, I mean, beginning of verse 18, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become circumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That's what Paul was trying to convey since the beginning. That it's not about these things anymore. It's about just keeping the commandments of God in our heart. But, but, but Paul would never say and definitely get rid of all these customs and circumcision. Why would Paul say that and have a few chapters ago, Paul circumcised his young disciple Timothy? He had to circumcise Timothy because he knew the Jews were only receptive to those who followed the law, those who were circumcised. They would only hear people out doctrinally and theologically if they'd been circumcised. So he circumcised Timothy. You see, Paul wasn't going to get rid of it because he knew he could use it as a tool for evangelism. But Paul was obviously going around preaching that we are saved by grace alone. Not by works, not by the law. But because Paul was preaching that message, it developed into these rumors. It's like that game telephone. You tell someone something, and they tell the next person, and they tell the next person, and by the time you get to the 10th person, it's a completely different story. Uh, they're saying that Paul said all these things, forsake Moses, don't let anyone be circumcised, uh, let go of the customs, but Paul never said that. Paul more so said, what's the point? We have Jesus now. Why follow customs and religion when now it's about relationship? Why do these things? It's not about circumcision anymore. It's about having the commandments of God in our heart. But all of that has developed into these rumors circulating amongst thousands of Jews, and it has reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem and James. So James is saying, wow, we've got to do something about this. So that's what it tells us in the next verse. In 22, it says, what then? As, as James is going to say, listen, Paul, I have a suggestion to, to clean up this whole mess, to, to, to dilute all these false rumors. What then? The assembly must certainly meet for they will hear that you have come. As in Paul, the moment someone finds out you're here, it's going to spread like wildfire. So we need to put a cap on this before people find out you're here. Let, let's figure out what we're going to do before things go really sour. So in verse 23, therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. And evidently, these four men, they are believers. They are Jewish men who have come to the faith in Jesus Christ. But they still hold on and still live under customs. They still hold on to the customs of Judaism. And we have to understand that it was difficult for a Jew uh, to let go of their heritage. Like Peter, he didn't want to let go of the dietary laws even though he became a Christian. There were many Jews who didn't want to let go of circumcision. There were many Jews that didn't want to let go of the sacrificial system. Because we have to understand they were people that were born in Jerusalem, grew up in Jerusalem, surrounded by the sacrificial system, surrounded by priests surrounded by dietary laws, and all of a sudden, one day, they give their lives to Jesus, and they're told that they don't have to do any of that anymore. And they're like, well, that's, that's different. That's going to be hard for me. So it was really hard for them just to, 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 to know that Jesus took care of it all, that now their righteousness is only found in the blood of Christ. So it was really hard for them to think, yeah, okay, we'll just, we'll, we'll just have faith in Christ, and we'll, we'll put away all the law and the customs. But here are these four men, they want to take a vow, I believe, it's probably the Nazarite vow, which, of course, is not required by Christ. And there's nothing in the New Testament that requires you and I as Christians to shave our heads and then to take these vows. But evidently, these Christians 
who are still holding on to Judaism, believe they're still finding some type of favor in the eyes of God by giving these peace offerings, by taking these vows. So he says, take these four men. He says, take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things which they all inform concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So this is James's plan and the others saying, Paul, listen, we need to make you look like a good Jewish boy again. We need you to do just something super religious. Would you do that for us? And of course, Paul is willing to do this. Uh, he's willing to do this for the sake of evangelism, um, not for the sake of his own righteousness or, or any favor in the eyes of God. But he's saying, okay, I'll do this. But they're, they're saying, I want you to, to pay for their expenses. They're going to shave their heads. Evidently, there was, a, there was a price to pay in order to do that. So they say, Paul, as a matter of fact, you participate with them. And they're, everyone's going to see, the whole community's going to see that you're not anti-Jewish custom, that you're still walking orderly under the law, and in fact, even better, you're paying for other people to live under the law. That everyone's going to love you because of it, Paul. It's going to be great. But Paul writes, so again, and of course he's willing to do this, he writes, saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, For though I am free from all men, right, I don't have to do anything in regards to them, I have made myself a servant to all that I may win them more. And this is why Paul's going to do this, because he wants to win them more. And to the Jews that became as a Jew, that I may win the Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law. Like, I will participate in the law that I may win those who want to be under the law. Not that I think being under the law, it has any favor in towards righteousness or salvation, but I'm willing to do these things. And to those who are of the law, this would be the Gentiles as without the law. Not being without the law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I may win those who are without the law. So this is what Paul is going to be demonstrating here. To the Jews who become a Jew. To those who are under the law, he will happily abide under the law, though he knows it's not for his righteousness. So it goes on to tell us, in verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, as in, we know this is only for the Jews, this has nothing to do with the Gentiles, uh, but the only thing we require of the Gentiles is this, there's these four things, because the Gentiles had never lived under the law, so they had some kind of parameters to their faith, uh, almost like works to their faith. Um, we just ask that they refrain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. We saw all that take place in Acts 15. Verse 26, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So here's Paul trying to do the right thing. He's trying to show the community he is not anti-Jewish custom. Um, so here he's going to be doing the Nazarite vow, which is essentially a peace offering. Even though Paul knows he strictly has peace through Jesus Christ with God. He's willing to still do this. So again, verse 27. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, in this place. And for the, furthermore, he has brought in Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they have pre previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, who was a Gentile, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And notice that word in verse 29, supposed. This is just, again, a false rumor. They thought Paul brought a Gentile into the holy place. And so, here, here again, here's James and the others. They developed some great plan to reconcile Paul back into favor of the Jews. But as he's doing this, he encounters the Jews of Asia, who hate Paul, who persecuted Paul, who followed Paul. And they begin to belch out, saying, Men of Israel held that this man, Paul, he is no good. He speaks against the law, he speaks against Moses, he speaks against the temple. But worse than it yet, Paul has brought in a Greek, a Gentile into this holy place. And we must understand the context here of what the Jews of Asia are saying. They're accusing Paul of bringing a Jew, I mean a Greek or Gentile, into the court of women. You see, the temple, at the outer courts, the outer courts were designated for the Gentiles. It was the court of the Gentiles. And that's where they could go. But unfortunately, 
The Jews had turned that to a marketplace because they had no reverence, no respect for Gentiles coming to worship God at the temple. But beyond that, you had the court of Gentiles, then you had the court of women. And there was a three-foot wall that divided the two. And there was a sign there that was written in Greek and Latin. And it said these words here. Let me find the exact words so I don't butcher this. I don't know where it is. I had it somewhere. But nonetheless, they're saying if any Gentile, any Greek, passes beyond these barricades, these boundaries, their blood will be on themselves. That they're ensuing death upon themselves. They will die. You see, at this point, Rome, this is very interesting, Rome has stripped away the right from the Jews to exercise the death sentence, which for them would be by stoning. But somehow the Jews found provision within the laws. The Romans saw how the Jews it, it has such a stronghold in their hearts not let any Gentile into the court of women. That the Romans actually allowed them to perform the death sentence just within those walls, even if it was a Roman citizen. And, and that's just mind-blowing that Rome would ever allow such a thing as that. So here they are, right? And they're saying, you brought someone in here. And you shouldn't have brought someone in here. So there's this death sentence that, that Paul might face um, so going forward, again, all this is lies. Verse 30, and all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. But this is interesting, guys. Um, before we kind of move a little more forward, again, there's that wall of partition between the Jew and the, and the, and the Greek. It was very hostile, uh, to the point that people would lose their lives if they were to cross over that wall. But Paul wrote amazing words in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, starting with verse 13. He said, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Paul is saying, listen, God has broken down that law of partition. And many people in the church have made the mistake of building up that wall again. Putting up a wall between denominations, putting a wall up between man and God. You know, recently I was at a Catholic church, and it was just full of partaking of liturgy, it was full of tradition. And they gave off the impression that if I didn't do the things the way they did things, that I wasn't as close to God as they were. They had this wall up between man and God. They were putting something between man and God. And I was actually slightly rebuked by the priest, a funny story, um, for supposedly taking communion the wrong way. But because I took it the wrong way, apparently it meant nothing. That I wasn't ordered me to take it. Um, but here, the, the church is building up walls. And there's nothing moving about it when I was there. There's nothing touching about it. Because the only thing that can move a man, the only thing that can touch the heart of a person is being encountered by Jesus Christ himself. But if the church is putting up these walls of partition between man and God, God can't touch them. They can't just go before God. But Jesus has broken down that wall by the cross and by his blood that we don't need people between us. We don't need a priest between us besides the high priest, Jesus Christ. We don't need tradition. There should never be, nor should we ever put anything between us and God's love for us. Nothing. Because Jesus, again, has broken down that wall. And so now we're beginning to see this riot break out. In verse 26. I mean, in verse um, 30. No, or was it 27? I don't know where I went. 30, yes. Pick a number, any number. And all the city was disturbed by this. And the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. Now, as they were seeking to kill Paul, 
News came to the commander of the garrison. This would be the tribune. He was a man that saw over thousands of soldiers, or a thousand soldiers, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So northeast of the temple precincts was the Antonia Fortress that Herod the Great built and it had porches on it where people could look down, the Romans could look down into the temple precincts and see all that's going on. And so one of the soldiers must have seen this uproar break out. Paul is about to lose his life. And so he tells the commander, the tribune, to send soldiers. So he does. And in verse 32, he, he immediately took soldiers... And centurions, plural, a centurion is a hundred soldiers, but now there's centurions, hundreds of soldiers. And this is a headache for the tribune. Uh, here he has thousands of soldiers on duty during these mandatory feasts. Um, but they sent these centurions and they ran down to them. And when he saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains, just as Agabus has prophesied. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing, some another. So we know how crowds are. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks, and that is the Antonia Fortress. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him. 27 years ago, at this point, the people, the crowd, the temple precincts, were shouting out, away with him, speaking about Jesus Christ. And now, Paul was probably in that crowd, being a member of the Sanhedrin, shouting out, away with Jesus Christ, crucify him. And now here's Paul 27 years later, being taken away by the Romans, hearing the same exact phrase being spoken to him, away with him. You know, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul, no doubt, is being conformed to Jesus' death right here. And I wonder what the great apostle is thinking at this point in time as he's being carried away by the soldiers, hearing the crowd chant away with him. But now Paul is going to have this miraculous opportunity to share his testimony with the Jews in Jerusalem. But we will get there next week. It'll be fun. But one thing I would like for you to take away from all this is that in the middle of God's will, Paul suffered pain. He was just beat to an inch of his life that he may have the opportunity to share his testimony with people that would never have that opportunity again. As we follow Paul on this journey through the book of Acts, going from Jerusalem to Rome, we're going to see him stand before kings and rulers and give a testimony to the people of his life. So much that Paul is able to write in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So much. At the end of the letter, he says, All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Because he was walking in the will of God, and because he was willing to be obedient and suffer through that pain for a split moment, he was able to make his way to the inside, the inside of Rome. He was in Caesar's household, and he had the blessed opportunity to lead those people in Caesar's household to the Lord. And that's why he was able to say, brethren, I know that all of you thought this wasn't going to work out, but guess what? It worked out for the good. People came to Christ. So I want you to know there are things in your life that God is going to allow you to go through. I know many of you have already been through many, many things. But you go through those things not because God is punishing you, but you are going through those things because you are following God's will. And through it all, you're going to be able to point people to Jesus Christ. 
As you walk on this Christian journey, God is going to put people in your life who are looking for answers, who are going through the very things that you have already gone through, and you're going to be able to say, God brought me through that. Let me tell you how God, how Jesus Christ brought me through that trial. And say, yes, there are wounds, but there is healing. There is so much healing, not just for me, not just for you, but for everyone we encounter. So we will pick up in verse 37 next week and make our way all the way through um, Acts chapter 22. And it's going to be Paul sharing again his testimony, kind of recounting Acts chapter 9. Um, we'll see some new things, some good things, some encouraging things. So go ahead and read ahead. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for just speaking to us through this message. As we go verse upon verse, precept upon precept, just allowing your word to cleanse us, wash us, and, and to show us new things about who you are and who we are in you. And I just pray, God, that um, you just touch every life here. You continue to transform the lives and change lives. Help us to be great witnesses of you. Help us to keep our eyes fixated upon you when we go through pain, tragedy, heartache. Help us to know that there's a great purpose. And that you're going to put people in our lives that need to hear the things we've gone through, the testimony, God, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we want to share that with the world that people may know you. And God, we want to identify with your resurrection, your suffering, being conformed to your death, Lord, that you be with us. Even though that stuff hurts, <laughs> we live in these, these mortal flesh bodies, but God, we know the eternal glory that lies ahead and that outweighs all these present day afflictions. Help us not be moved from the purpose you have assigned to us, Lord. Um, by no matter what comes our way, Lord. So God, we love you. We may worship you. We know the last song, God, and we may just be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
pray that as we go up here, we can be Holy Spirit filled Christians by experience, Lord. Help us just to be filled here now as we go out, Lord, being a shining light to all the, exa- all the people around us, that we may be examples to the lost, the hurt, the broken, people that are looking for answers. Open up the door, open up divine appointments for us to share your truth and your glory with them, that they may find healing, but ultimately they may find salvation, God, which is the best spiritual uh, healing we need, Lord, for sinners like us. So that God, um, go before us and just bless us. In Jesus' name. Right. Let's say we have to die.